My subject matter for you today is not one that you're going to be, it's going to be new to anybody, I don't think. But if it is, I just want to pray that you will hang in there and listen to the presentation. Today we're going to talk about Christmas. What about Christmas and the other holidays? Or we could say the true origin of Christmas and the other holidays. For many years, Christmas and other major holidays such as Easter and Halloween and so on have been portrayed as having a Christian origin. But is that true? Is it possible that we have been deceived into believing that pagan customs and traditions of the past have their roots in the Christian church? Is it possible that many well-known Christian holidays or so-called holy days have their origins in something or someone other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life? Are innocent believers giving life to ancient satanic practices? Folks, in other words, are many faithful but misinformed Christians paying homage to false gods by honoring these pagan holidays and customs and at the same time thinking that they are pleasing the one true and living God. Is that possible? Yes. That's what we're going to talk about today. And of course I want this to be based on the Bible. And so I want to start with a Bible verse that is <coughs> given to us by Jesus Himself. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate. That word straight, um, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, means straight like this. This word straight doesn't mean that. In fact, it could mean the most crooked thing you ever saw. It's a completely different word. It's talking about something being difficult, something being hard. It says, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto eternal life. And then look at this last part. It's so sad. It says, and few there be that find it. Jesus' own words. The vast majority of people in the world, folks, I'm sorry, but the vast majority of people in the church, in the churches, are not going to find the right way. That's what the Bible teaches us to understand. Another great Bible verse that I want to put in here is Isaiah 8.20 to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is, there is no light in them. And then one other. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. It says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Amen? Sometimes the truth that's in the Bible is a little bit like hidden treasure, isn't it? And it requires a little effort on our part. It requires a little digging, if you will. And so we're going to do some of that today. But I don't think there's anything so very hard to understand in the Bible. Okay? I do believe the book is understandable and it makes perfect sense the way it is written. So, our story today begins in the book of Genesis in that great city that is called Babylon. You might think that's a strange place for us to start. But let's go to Genesis chapter 10 and look at 
a bit of verses 6, 7, and 8. It says, And the sons of Ham, Cush, and then the next verse says, And the sons of Cush, and then it says, verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod. Do you know who Ham is? You know about Ham. He's the son of Noah. And a name like Ham to us today sounds like an unclean name, doesn't it? But if you go back and study about the sons of Noah, you will find that he had three sons, and the one named Ham is the son in that story about the son that saw his father's nakedness. And the two other sons entered into the house backwards with a blanket. Remember that? Right. And they covered up their father's nakedness. And we're not here to talk about that story today. But suffice it to say that there is more to that story than most people realize. Ellen White, in commenting about it, says the unnatural crime of Ham. And the Bible also teaches that because of this Ham, what, uh, because of that, this Ham was cursed by God through his father, Noah. And when we read about the sons of God and the daughters of men, remember that? Right. It is really talking about the faithful families of Japheth and Shem, the other two brothers, versus the wicked families of Ham. That's kind of where it all began, and his descendants. So, what started with Cain and Abel is continued here at kind of a reset in the world's history, right? Because, remember, the whole world was destroyed but for eight people that entered into the ark. And... Now we are finding that there are, we're back to just two classes of people. What are they? The righteous and the wicked. It's very plain there. Another way you could say it when looking at the story of Cain and Abel is those that obey God and those that want to find another way. Right? Does that make sense? That's what was going on in these days of the sons of Noah and the descendants of Ham. And verse 8 says that Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. One source says that Nimrod became the first king of this world. And it was from his wicked leadership that we find what it says in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now I know you know the story, but there are some important things to make note of here. First, most people know this as the story of the Tower of Babel, right? Right. It's commonly, that's how we think of it. But you will notice that they builded a city and a tower, didn't they? And this becomes very important because eventually it is this great city called Babylon that is condemned in the book of Revelation. In the last day prophecies, right? And in Genesis, God told the people to spread all over the earth and populate it, right? right. Be fruitful and multiply. But they chose to gather together into a large city. Now, God didn't want us to live in the cities. Nope. He still really doesn't. Now, it's unfortunate that a lot of people do, and in this stage in Earth's history, a lot of people feel like they have to, okay, out of necessity. But God never really intended for man to live in the large cities. He placed us where? In a garden, 
right? Mm -hmm. He placed us in a country home setting, didn't he? Right. And they also planned to build this tower. And what was the purpose for the tower? So that they could be safe from any future earth-destroying flood, right? But now, think about it. God had already promised them that He would never again destroy the earth by a flood, right? And so, the whole story here is how the people rejected the one true God of the Bible and adapted to another false system of religion. And believe it or not, it goes all the way back to the first few pages in our Bible when it talks about Babel. By the way, if you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, the word Babel is the exact same word that elsewhere in the, New, in the Old Testament is Babylon. And in the New Testament, the word that is rendered Babylon there, it mentions that it's the same place as Babel in the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. So there's no difference between Babel and Babylon. This is the beginning of that great city, and the tower was a part of that story. So, we're talking about a false system of worship. Bear with me for a few moments. And bear with some of my artwork because, you know, I get these little pictures and I have to blow them up so that you can see them and sometimes they get a little bit grainy and all. But this notorious leader called Nimrod had a wife by the name of Semiramis. Semiramis was a beautiful woman, but she was very vile and evil-minded like her husband Nimrod. The influence of these two people, Nimrod and Semiramis, led many to turn away from the good examples of Shem and Japheth, the other sons of Noah, and so many people fell into great apostasy. In other words, they rejected God. Some of them, most of them, all together. As a result of this apostasy, you remember, you recall the story of Abraham. What was the first thing God kind of had to do with Abraham? That he called him out of a place called the Ur of the Chaldees, which was where this was at. It was kind of the, we call it now the cradle, the fertile crescent, the cradle of civilization. It's what would now be Babylon and Iran. But, as a result of this apostasy, there were many pagan customs and traditions that were introduced. In Babylon, there were temples called ziggurats where they erected these for idol worship. And through these means, many pagan customs were nurtured and promoted far and wide. And when the story of Babylon happened and God dispersed them and sent them all over the world, what happens to the customs and the practices? They went with them. Now, God originally had wanted us to go all over the whole earth and to multiply and, you know, to fill it up. But the real point behind that was so that we could be the light of the world and share the gospel with all the people of the world. And instead, look what happens in this story. When God disperses them from the Tower of Babel, they go everywhere and they take the foolish and the false pagan customs with them. So, many of these things are still practiced and observed today, including the recognition of December 25th, what we call Christmas, as a special day. Yet, most of these practices date back as far back as the time of the fall of Babel, the Tower of Babel. So they've been around, the so-called Christmas has been around for thousands of years before Christ. In that form, right? And so 
This is an ancient drawing of Semiramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz. And you see it's very occultic, and you see they're like uh, suspending the earth, you know, there as though they are the gods of this world. Well, that's just exactly what happened in the false religion of this world. Nimrod was made like unto a god. Semiramis was made a goddess. And, of course, Tammuz is their offspring, and he's used in that exact same way. Another of these pictures, and you, you can go online and you can just find so much information uh, like what, what we're talking about here. Okay, this is not one man's opinion. This is not one church's opinion. This transcends a lot of different denominations. And the information is widespread in the encyclopedia and on the internet. And it's amazing how you can go to so many different sources and find the exact same story. Okay? But... You notice here, Nimrod is labeled as the sun god. I didn't make any of these images that I'm going to show you today. I just got them from other sources because there are so many out there. No need for me to do the work. And Semiramis is the moon goddess of ancient Babylon on this picture. She's the wife and the mother of Nimrod. That sounds funny. But the reason that that happens in the mythology here, her husband Nimrod had already died. And she is left alone. She didn't come from royalty. It's not like it is today. Okay? So there was no reason to think that the people were going to keep her around once her husband is gone. And so... She concocted this whole thing to uh, this whole story, this mythology. She concocted it for her own self preservation. Before too long, she had an illegitimate, now it was too long, but not too, too long. She had an illegitimate son. That means that she was sleeping with somebody besides her husband. He's dead and gone. When her child was born, he was named Tammuz, and he was born on December the 25th. Sound familiar? Who are we worshiping on December the 25th? Good question. But she had concocted this idea that Nimrod didn't die, that he went away to be the sun god. He was, he was drawn into the heavens. Well, when the baby was born, she came up with another lie to tell, and she said it was the reincarnation of Nimrod. So Tammuz is both known as the sun, and he's also known as the sun, S-U-N, God. Okay? Works both ways. But think about it. Where does reincarnation come from? Right here in this story. And a lot of other things. And the first thing I want to say about that is, don't try to make too much sense out of this because the devil doesn't care what you call him as long as you worship him. That's all he wants is to be worshipped. And he doesn't care what you call him. He doesn't care whether you think he's male or female. He doesn't care whether you think his name is Semiramis, Tammuz, Jesus or Mary. As long as you're doing what is worship of not the true God and not the way the Bible tells us to worship. Because that's the only worship that God accepts. Does that make sense? So who was really born on December 25th? When Nimrod, the founder of Babylon, died, Semiramis told the people that her husband's spirit had taken possession of the sun. She encouraged the people to pay homage to her husband by worshiping the sun. And so began the evil practice of sun worship. And by the way, of all the false religions in the world, that is number one. It's always number one. 
Later on, when Semiramis gave birth to this illegitimate son by the name of Tammuz, she hid her licentious form of living by lying to the people. She told them that she was miraculously overshadowed by the spirit of her dead husband Nimrod, and it was in this way that she was able to bring forth this so-called Son of God. Now, along about right here, you ought to be thinking to yourself, now, all of this sounds eerily familiar. How many of you know that the devil loves to counterfeit the true? What God has done, he does his best to have a counterfeit of everything that God does and what he has. Semiramis also declared that her son Tammuz was in actuality the return or rebirth of her husband Nimrod. Hence, through this teaching comes the doctrine of reincarnation. And since Tammuz was born on December 25th, that day is highly honored and recognized by Nimrod's supporters. And even though the name Nimrod has kind of passed away, in this 21st century, do we still have Christmas? Yeah. And do we still do some of the things that they did even way back then to worship Nimrod and Tammuz and Semiramis? Very interesting. We're going to see some things. Long before Christianity existed, this style of worship was already being done in the name of Tammuz. Not until many centuries later, this pagan custom was Christianized, I like to say. Baptized, if you will, as being the birthday of Christ, or Christmas Day. The similarity between some of the ancient pagan beliefs and the truth is notable. You can tell that we're trying to counterfeit what God really did with his son, right? And the virgin birth and, and many of those different things. And so, I want to show you a quote from a wonderful book. One of the good books that documents what we're talking about today is called The Two Babylons, all right? There's another one called The Illuminati. There's another one called 666, The Antichrist. And I've got those books and I would be glad to loan them to you if you're interested in them. But from the two Babylons, page 58 and 59, it says, If there was one who was more deeply concerned in the tragic death of Nimrod than another, it was his wife, Semiramis, who from an originally humble position had been raised to share with him the throne of Babylon. In life, her husband had been honored as a hero. In death, she will have him worshipped as a god. Yea, as the woman's promised seed, Zero Ashta, who was designed to bruise the serpent's head, and who in doing so was to have his own heel bruised. Now this Zero Ashta is another name for Tammuz. Okay? What you're going to find is that Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz get passed all around the world. And another thing that happened at the time of the flood, or at the time of the Tower of Babel, was that the languages were confused. The Bible tells us about that. So, now as they go around the different parts of the world, there's different names. It's not Semiramis and Nimrod anymore. There are other names. And with every different religion, you get a different name, maybe a few different details, but largely the story is exactly the same. And notice what it says here about Tammuz, about Zero Ashta, that he was to bruise the serpent's head and in so doing was to have his own heel bruised. Who is that? Genesis 3.15 tells us that about Jesus. So it's obvious here that the pagan religion is counterfeiting the true God. 
and His only begotten Son. Right? Right. So, when we look at these images, because of the deifying of her husband, it was not long before Nimrod's followers began to also worship Semiramis. She becomes a goddess. And her son Tammuz, or this Zero Ashta, was worshipped as well. More and more, Semiramis was revered by the people and was viewed by many as a priestess and a goddess. Now think about this. You've got a father, you've got a mother, and you've got a child. Okay? This was the original trinity. This was the original pagan trinity. The mother, the father, and really and truly the mother comes first because all of this was of her concocting. Nimrod was an evil man, but he didn't come up with all this stuff. It was done after his demise. And so it's just very interesting. The mother, the father, and the child makes up that first trinity. And the Trinity is something that the religious world is hanging to, hanging on to for dear life. Even the Seventh day Adventist Church. Yes, Kay? Even the birth, it wasn't a virgin birth, but the husband was not there. But it was so, made to appear like a virgin birth or something. So that's that counterfeit. Kind of nearly like it. You're exactly, you're exactly right. Look at this. Ellen White wrote in the Great Controversy on page 551. It says the doctrine of man's consciousness in death, especially the belief that the spirits of the dead return to minister to the living, has prepared the way for modern spiritualism. And you and I know from studying the prophecies that spiritual, uh, excuse me, spiritualism is the thing that's going to deceive almost the whole world in the last days, right? right? Isn't that what we've been told? It's uncanny. What you have on the first page of the book is amazingly exactly what you have on the last pages of the book. Right? right. But yet most Christians don't have a clue about this. Another random collage of pictures that I got off of the internet. Folks, the worship of Nimrod, and especially Semiramis, became widespread when the builders of the tower were scattered throughout the earth and their languages were confused. Along with them, the people carried all the satanic beliefs and practices that were introduced to them while dwelling on the plains of Shinar. So with time, these views were remodeled to suit the different civilizations, as I said before, that peopled the earth. Nevertheless, they all basically stemmed from the religious views that started there at Babel or Babylon. Again, from the book, The Two Babylons, the Chaldean mysteries can be traced up to the days of Semiramis, who lived only a few centuries after the flood. So that's going back to the very beginning of the book, isn't it? Right. We have the history. We're able to trace these things. It's not such a mystery if we're willing to look and apply ourselves. It says, and who is known to have impressed upon them the image of her own depraved and polluted mind. This picture represents Semiramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz. Egyptian style. Egyptian style. That's a good way of putting it. I like that. Egyptian style. They get new names. Now it's Osiris, Isis, and Horus. But it's still the pagan Babylonian trinity. So, in Egypt, although there were many gods, the three main deities were these. 
They're substitute names for Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. In Rome, they were known as Saturn, Venus, and Jupiter. While in Greece, they were known as Kronos, Ray, and Zeus. In other lands, such as in India and China, they were also known and worshipped under different names. And so we see that following the fall of the Tower of Babel, the religion of Babylon continued to live on under many different disguises. In many places, these original Babylonian practices were reintroduced and preserved through the historical records, myths, and religions, teachings, and customs of the people. So much so that even the first day of the week, Sunday, continued to be recognized as the day of the sun. The venerable day of the sun. Constantine put it in the year 321 A.D. What does the word venerable mean? It's a kind of worship. So what it's saying is the worshipful day of the sun. Why is the first day of the week Sunday? Not the third, not the fourth, or the seventh for that matter. The first day is the day of the sun, the worshipful day of the sun, because that was the most honored of all of these false gods of the false religion of this world. Okay? Following the scattering of the builders of the Tower of Babel, many people throughout the earth were worshipers of the sun. They too were known to worship the sun. The Druid priests were also known to offer human sacrifices to their God, and they performed many supernatural feats. They were known to worship in the woods or groups of trees called groves. And when you study your Bible, you will find often those kings that we talked about in Sabbath school class, they, the good kings tore down the groves. What are groves? That's trees. Why would you tear down the trees? Because it was a place of worship. They were worshiping these false gods. The good kings tore down the groves. The bad kings built them up. They planted groves. They made houses of worship to worship Baal and these false gods. Another picture that I think is very interesting because I know you at least recognize one of these ladies. Right? Everybody recognizes one of these ladies, right? But is it not fairly obvious that they're all the same? And who do you think it is? It all goes back. It's all traceable back to Semiramis. You know, folks, sun worship became popular worldwide, even among the children of Israel. The sun god Baal was worshipped. You remember some Bible stories about Baal? You remember Elijah had the priest of Baal and the priest of the groves and he had that showdown at Mount Carmel. Right. Uh. <laughs> that was about Baal worship. Mm -hmm. Such a practice was condemned by Jehovah. Right? right. Completely mm -hmm. condemned by God. Mm -hmm. And folks, drastic consequences were outlined by him for all of the offenders to the point that thousands were put to their death. Right? right. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Bible says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That was the worship of a false god named Molech. And they did that 
by actually sacrificing their children in a fire to this false god. Or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And look at this last part. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. That's what he said to his chosen people, Israel. You're not going to be like these other nations around you that do all these wicked things. But what did they do? Did they follow the true and living God all the way? Or did they, in fact, chase after these other gods from these other nations around them? And folks, what about today? This is talking about people sacrificing their children to a false idol, a false god. But I have to ask the question, are we not sacrificing our children to these same false gods right now today? Well, yeah, the TV could be, you know, the boob god. I was called boob too, right? So that's the boob god. But folks, the worship of these false gods of Old Testament in the Bible, of the Old Testament in the Bible, are still around today. They have not gone away. Sometimes they have different names. Sometimes they don't. There are just pagans in our world today. It's becoming more and more popular today. Okay? What does God say about this? I mean, is it okay? It's an abomination. It's an abomination. There's not a stronger word in the Bible than abomination. Look at Ezekiel chapter 8. It says, He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. In the very temple of God. The tabernacle in this case. But in the very temple of God, they're worshiping the sun. And they're calling it Jehovah worship. Think of how, how terrible this is. Now, just really quickly, I didn't put a picture up, but if you know anything about the sanctuary, you know that it was always positioned a certain way. The door was to the east. The the altars progressed to the west. That's a good way of putting it. And so, when these people were going to worship the sun in this Bible verse, in this chapter, they had to turn their backs on Jehovah and His worship, and they had to face the rising sun to the east. And they worshipped it. Is anybody worshiping the rising sun today? It's very interesting. One of the things we do on Easter Sunday, not we, but, you know, as people, one of the things we do is to go out before the sun arises and to worship God as the sun arises in the east. And people think they're worshiping Jehovah when they do that. But what does Jehovah think about that? It's abomination. Abomination, that's exactly right. Again, Exodus 22 in verse 20, He that sacrificeth unto any god, save the Lord only, that word Lord is all capital, and it is actually Jehovah in the original language. What happens? 
he shall be utterly destroyed. That's exactly right. Now I've got to speed some of this up. But in ancient Rome, the god Saturn was worshipped. And by the way, the seventh day of the week, we have named Saturday. After Saturn. And along with this idolatry, the winter solstice was highly regarded. A week-long winter festival called Saturnalia was celebrated by them in honor of the reappearance of the sun in the northern hemisphere, the cold part. The final day of this festival, Brumalia, fell on December 25th. This was regarded as the day of the invincible sun. December 25th, anciently was known as the day of the invincible sun. During these festivals, there was much gaiety, feasting, and even the exchanging of gifts very similar to the manner in which Christmas is celebrated today. Yet, all these customs existed many years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And as we can see, they were all in honor of these false religions, these false gods. Surely the activities involved in these ancient Roman festivals give us a good example of what obviously predominated the celebration of Tammuz's birthday anciently. And so we see that the date, December 25th, was a day of pagan origin in honor of the sun god. It's also interesting to note the name Saturn from which Saturnalia derives was another name for Nimrod. So, what we're talking about is an organized false religion in this world. And it's comprised of many false abominations, the Bible says. And these things are very easy to learn about, and there are many good books on the subject, and of course you can just Google it. But what started at Babylon, or Babel, has continued down through the centuries until today. The names and some of the details have changed, but by and large, the information is so consistent that anyone with an honest heart and a willingness to listen can see that it's the false worship that came from Babylon way back there at the very beginning. And the mother goddess worship of Babylon. The false trinity worship of Babylon. And the sun god worship of Babylon. But folks, where has all of this landed in this last day generation in which we live? Folks, it has landed in the false worship that is by detail outlined in the prophecies of the books of Daniel and Revelation. And you and I know exactly who that is. It's the papacy. It's the Roman Catholic religion. And folks, that's exactly where Christmas has landed. I had a man come up to me one day and he says, they tell me you don't keep Christmas. You're a preacher. You don't keep Christmas. <laughs> I said, no, I don't keep any of the Catholic holidays. I don't know why I said it just that way, but I did. I said, I don't keep any of the Catholic holidays. And he goes, is Christmas Catholic? I said, yo, Christ Mass. And you know, the lights came on. And the man looked at me and he says, I never thought of that. But that's obvious, isn't it? Yes, it is. I got one better than that. Better than Christ Mass. How about Mary Christ Mass? Look at this picture. I didn't make it. I didn't make it. I just got it off the internet. 
The original pagan worship in Babylon was all about the Madonna, the mother goddess, and her child. What's it all about today? It's the Madonna worship. And really, the only thing you could do better than this would be to make Jesus a baby. Because most of the times, almost every time that you see a picture of Jesus in this respect, he's either a baby in the manger or he's a dead man on the cross. <laughs> I know a song. I, I've got a song for that, right? But I know a song. It said, he's not a baby in the manger. He's not a dead man on the cross. Now, he was both of those things. And they are important to the story. But is Jesus a baby? No. no. Is he a dead man? No. No. My song says, I've loved it for years and years and years, He's not a baby in a manger, nor a dead man on the cross. He's the ever-living, life-giving Jesus, Lord of all. Amen. Amen. Amen? He is the only begotten Son of the Most High God. What about Santa and Christmas trees? <laughs> I need to save some time, so I'm going to just cut this out. You folks don't really need to know all this stuff about Santa and Christmas trees. Even a child can see that that has nothing to do with the Bible or with Christ. Amen? Yeah. But you rest assured, Santa Claus is indispensably aligned. He's connected to Christmas, isn't he? And if you try to take him away from the people, they'll get mad. They'll get mad. We are going to talk a little bit about the Christmas trees, maybe in a different way than you would expect. But, folks, do Santa Claus and Christmas trees have anything to do with Jesus? in any stretch of your imagination. No. Folks, if you truly desire to follow the example of Jesus, aren't you going to take the things that He took and leave the things that He left? Isn't that what we should do with our lives? Amen. Shouldn't we follow Jesus all the way in every part of our life? Jesus said in John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In that same chapter, in verse 6, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Didn't He? We want the truth. We don't want mythology. That's just a fancy way of saying lies. It's falsehoods. But there is a Bible verse for the Christmas tree. Jeremiah 10, verses 2 through 5, says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen. Whose way? Heathen. The heathen. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Dismayed means you can't quite figure things out. It's a mystery. Well, I'm telling you something. If you're true and faithful to the true God and you read His Bible, life's not a mystery to you. By and large, we understand it. And I'm talking about through and through. God is so good that way. Four, the customs of the people are vain. What is vain? Not worthless. 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 Absolutely worthless. The customs of the people are vain. 
For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go of their own. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Now some people will read this to you and say, see, the Bible right there says you don't have to be afraid of the Christmas tree. You can have one. Well, I will tell you something. You don't ever have to be afraid of anybody and their Christmas tree. But I do believe that if we go against God, we have to be afraid of Him. Amen. There's a big, big difference there. Now, I want to tell you that I've heard preachers say this Bible verse is not talking about a Christmas tree. Okay? And I'm willing to agree with you on that. I think that what this verse is actually talking about, you cut down a tree, you get a big block of wood, and then you carve out an image of something, and you deck it with gold, and you deck it with silver, and you maybe nail it to a stand, put it up high or something like that. That very well may be true. But I am here to tell you that that Bible verse just about perfectly describes the Christmas tree. And whether it meant to or not, it perfectly applies to the Christmas tree because the Christmas tree was worshipped as a god. So it is of necessity an idol. And if we have idols in our home, what are we doing, whether we mean to or not? It's a, it's a thing of worship. Right? Now, I got silly on this, but now look at it. They cut the tree, then they deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. And here's my pictures for that. Anybody remember Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer from your childhood? Yeah. I mean, I was indoctrinated. <laughs> Burl Ives. Burl Ives. And you told me one time, that's who you look like. Burl Ives. Burl Ives. Frosty. Yes. He sang, silver and gold, silver and gold. That's what he's doing right here means so much more when I see silver and gold decorations on every Christmas tree. Right? Yep. Wow. So, you can't deny the silver and the gold part. That was a big part of it. And here's my other picture. <laughs> That's the nails and the hammer. How did they used to put these Christmas trees up? They nailed them, didn't they? And I know we've got fancier ways of doing these things. But folks, it says there that they cannot move. They cannot speak. They cannot even stand up straight without the carpenter's help. Right? right. So they're not a god. No matter what we do with them. Who only is God? Isaiah 40, verse 18. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare to Him? What are we going to make that's going to represent God in our worship? And we have been warned by God Himself not to go there not to make any kind of image that represents Him to us. 
And if we do, what does he call it? An idol. And better than that, you're right, Arthur, he calls it an abomination. That same chapter, look at this. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One. It does not matter that this was not talking about a Christmas tree, that this was talking about making an image out of something. We're still taking a tree from the forest and we're decking it with silver and gold. We're dressing it up. We're giving it the pro prominent place in our house and we're putting gifts at its feet. It does not take a rocket scientist to figure out that we're worshiping the Christmas tree, whether we think we are or not. If we make anything a God before Jehovah, what are we doing? We're worshiping them. We're worshiping idols. But like Malachi 3, y'all knew I was going to bring this back, didn't you? Two weeks in our Sabbath school, we've talked about Malachi 3. God says, you've robbed me. What do the people say? Well, yeah, but yeah, yeah. how have we robbed thee? <laughs> and there's a whole chapter full of things. God says you did it, and then they have this, I just I have to do it with a whiny little voice. But how, God, how did we do this? Nowadays you hear people say, but I don't worship my Christmas tree. And I get that. I don't really think there's very many people in the whole world that set out to worship their Christmas tree. I really don't. But, I don't care what you say about it. I only care what God says about it. And what did we just read? What does God say about it? Don't do what the heathen do. You know what a heathen is? It's a pagan. It's somebody that worships the other gods, the false gods. And the Lord makes it clear just exactly what we're doing when we do any of their foolish customs. It is worship. Whether we think so or not, and whether we care or not. So many honest and faithful believers will ask, how could anyone say that it's wrong for Christians who love their blessed Lord and Savior to celebrate the glorious birth of their Master? But folks, all Bible students agree that Jesus, the source of of light and truth for our world, spent his whole life seeking to uphold the truth. Amen? Amen? Amen. And the truth alone. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Certainly, if it was the Savior's will that his birthday be upheld by his followers from generation to generation, he would have indicated this. You remember Hebrews chapter 4 that we talked about? If he would have given us another day, like Sunday instead of Sabbath, he would have told us. He would have also given us the details, wouldn't he? Well, if he would have given us his birthday to keep, wouldn't he have told us so? Wouldn't he have given us all the details, the do's and the do's nots? Do's nots. That was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> Folks, we don't even know when his birthday actually is. Right? Right. 
Now, we're smart enough to know it wasn't December 25th because that's the coldest part of the year in that part of the, of the world. And the shepherds wouldn't have been out there abiding their flocks at night. We've got several ways that we know that it was not December 25th. But folks, we don't know when it was. Not exactly. I think we can know close. We can know the season. We know that it was the fall of the year. Because he was crucified in the spring of the year and his life included a half year. Right? And the Bible makes that easy to understand. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says, There were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And that just could not simply have happened in the coldest part of the year. It would not have happened. Also, Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, there's that decree that went forth from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. What sense would it make for the Caesar to do this at the time of year when it's nearly impossible for the people to travel these long distances that they needed to do? After all, what was his main goal? Was it to make the people suffer? Or was it to get their money? Well, if they don't come, you don't get their money, do they? John 18 verse 39 says, But you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now, the time of Jesus' birth can be greatly determined by just following the, the events surrounding his life and maybe counting backwards. Okay? We know that it was 30 years to his baptism, and then we know that it was three and a half years to his crucifixion. And so it's really easy. If you've got the half year, you know it's going to be six months or so before where it all ended at the Passover. If you look, this is the Catholic liturgical calendar. And what I want to say to us all is this Christ Mass is part of a system of worship. The holidays, which are actually supposed to be holy days, of this false religion, they are not the holy days that are talked about in the Scriptures, and thus they have replaced the true worship of the true God with another system. Just like Cain did, and he was condemned for it. Just like Israel did, and they were condemned for it. Just like the beast power does in those prophecy books. And they're condemned for all these abominations, aren't they? Roman Catholicism, the papacy, is the very thing that the Bible is warning us about in these last days. And if you will just take a look, you will find references to this false worship throughout the Bible. We're late, and I'm going to go very quickly. But in Acts 12, verse 4, that in the King James Version of the Bible, the word Easter actually appears there. And it's a strange thing, because it does not belong there. If you read it in context, it's one of God's holy days that it's talking about. It's the Passover. And if you look at it, when you look up that word, it's the word Pascha, like Paschal Lamb. It literally means the Passover. And that's the only definition that's given for this word is the Passover. Those last two words are how it is used in the Bible. One time it is rendered Easter, 28 times, because there's a total of 29, right? You're okay. You're okay. You're okay. I'm sorry it's running long. God bless you guys. It's good to meet you, Charlie. All right.
daughter sir. Amen. Amen. So one time it's rendered Easter. 28 times it's rendered Passover. And the only definition in there is Passover. It's not talking about Easter. They do roughly happen at the same time of year, but it's not Easter that's being talked about here. Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death. Now the reason I'm reading this Bible verse is that we hear well-meaning Christians all the time say they keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. Right? You heard that a time or two? Dozens for me. Do you agree with it? The Bible says we're to, to honor, keep baptism in honor of the resurrection. That's the only thing that the Bible says about that. But well-meaning Christians say they keep Sunday in honor of the resurrection. And that's what I'm talking about. Through the papacy, the devil has tricked almost the whole world into following him and rejecting the truth of God's Word. And these pagan holidays are all part of this exact same false system of worship that Sunday comes from. It's all the same. And I just quickly want to look at a few more Bible verses. Ezekiel 8. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the house which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Study it out. Look it up. The 40 days of weeping for Tammuz has become the 40 days of Lent in the Advent festival of the Roman Catholic Church. In Jeremiah 7, verse 18, the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Who is the Queen of Heaven, folks? Who in the Bible is the Queen of Heaven? In the Bible, Mary is the Queen of Heaven? I want to make sure we get this straight. Because what you said, Thomas, is what much of the world believes. Even non-Catholic people will put that together and they'll come up with that answer. But do we believe that Mary is the Queen of Heaven? No, 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 we don't believe No, absolutely not. Who is the Queen of Heaven? Now, hopefully, after today's presentation, we should know that it is Semiramis. Or we could call her by a dozen other names, right? Isis, Ishtar. Isis, Ishtar, Venus. You know, it just goes on and on and on. But... Look at what it says. The children of Israel, by the way. This is not talking about the pagan nations around them. This is talking about the children of Israel. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire. The women need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings. Do you see the word offering? That lets you know without any shadow of a doubt. It's worship. The children of Israel were worshiping these false gods and goddesses. And what does it do? Don't miss the last line. That they may do what? Provoke me, Provoke me to anger. Baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Have you ever heard of hot cross buns? That's a part of Catholicism and it's based on this very practice that goes back. There's a T for Tammuz on the bun. You're exactly right. It's not actually the cross. It is a T for Tammuz. They call it the Tau, which is the Greek letter in the, in the Greek alphabet. Jeremiah 44, verse 19. Bear with me just a few more minutes. And when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, we made Make her cakes to what? Worship her. Worship her. 
Now, did you live through that? Did you live through it? Are you okay? I know it was long. We went too long. I didn't mean to go that long. But I'm not through. I'm through with the study. But I'm not through. I brought some pictures to show you. Can you watch some pictures for me? Sure. Here we go. I got you some pictures. None of which I took. None of which I made. Just some I collected as I was doing research on the internet. You know, a greeting card's a wonderful thing. Especially when it tells the truth. What if all of our greeting cards told the truth? They wouldn't buy none. I got news for you. <laughs> Most of our greeting cards don't necessarily tell the truth. But I've got a couple on here that do. It says, Merry Christmas. May Christmas be full of pagan rituals masked in monotheism. <laughs> that card tells the truth. Is that okay? I don't think that's what we need. But I put this last part in here because what should we do having seen all of this, having known all of these things? It, it should bring something out of us, should it not? The shocking pagan origins of Christmas. And I got this because of the picture and because it says Christmas before it was Christmas. Right? Because you had to have Christ before you got the actual name Christmas. Before that, it was Saturnalia and those other pagan rituals and festivals. But look at the picture up there. <clears throat> kind of interesting. Another card that tells the truth. Christmas is celebrating the birth of a Jewish Savior six months off from his actual birthday on a date stolen from pagans using pagan traditions. What if we told the truth? What if we sent cards to everybody that, that told the truth? <laughs> I'm guessing we'd probably be in trouble. Uh, Doug's cousin married a lady who is a practicing pagan, mm -hmm. and she sent out winter solstice cards instead of Christmas cards. <laughs> well, I've done it in other presentations. I don't have it in this one, but, but that... I think that sounds... But some of you know that wheel that I showed you, that's mm -hmm. the Catholic, Catholic liturgical wheel. Mm -hmm. I can show you almost the exact same wheel, and it's not Catholic at all. It's pagan. It's Wiccan. Which, not many days ago, I found out that Wiccan is not the right way to say that. It's Witchin. They actually, they actually call it Witchin. Isn't that interesting? Powerful or pagan? I'm just showing you that there's an abundance of people that know what I'm talking about. And it transcends all religious denominations. The history of Christmas. Christmas celebrations were around long before Christ. They were called something different. The early Catholic Church wanted to attract pagans to Christianity, so they compromised. Christmas is rooted in paganism and in Babylonian sun worship. And there's a lot of people that will say all of that, and they'll say, so it doesn't really matter. So it's just a yeah, it's just a bunch of fun. It's just innocent fun. You hear that a lot. Innocent fun. It's the same well, kind of innocent fun when you pick up the, the Ouija board thing. Well, innocent yeah. Fun. Yeah. My problem is, I don't care what you say about it, and I hope you don't care what I say about it. <laughs> you need to figure out what you're going to do about it. We both should only care what God says about it. And you can find these little places. Now you've got to do your work and you've got to put things together. But the Queen of Heaven is in the Bible. That aspect of this worship is in there. Tammuz is in the Bible by name. We can put this together. We can figure it out.
somebody else put an X on the Christmas tree because Christmas is a pagan holiday and not biblical. I'm going to tell you, I found one of these. I'm actually going to show you one, but I found one of these things that said Christmas is not pagan and it never has been. So if you want to believe that, you'll find somebody out there that's preaching that <laughs> message. But I just don't think in light of God's holy word, we can take that position. It's impossible. Look at this one. Sacred tree worship. Quotes those verses from Jeremiah chapter 10 that we read earlier. It says, people bow down to the tree to receive gifts from it, all the while singing praise and worship to the tree. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. Now, I'm just showing you what somebody's got up here. Okay, I'm not necessarily signing on to the whole thing. But I do remember singing as a child, Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. It's in one of our hymnals. Christmas tree? That was one of them. Yeah, I remember it being in one of our hymnals. Oh, I'm so very sorry to hear that. That's an abomination. I don't think it's in this one, but, it, but the original, the old one, it was in that one. But, but don't miss this. What are we teaching our children to worship? Because children have a way of putting things together even when we've got a way of rationalizing it away. Isn't that right? Yeah, they are. Another card. You see, son, we buy a Christmas tree to celebrate an ancient pagan tradition stolen by Christians. It's the truth. It's the truth. You remember that song? Have yourself a... Not this time. Have yourself a pagan little Christmas. What if cards told the truth? Look at this one. It's blurry. It's hard to read. But Christmas is not accepted by Christ. It's not Bible. It's men's tradition. It's pagan. It's fables. The Bible condemns these practices, so why do millions of church folks celebrate them along with the world? I agree. Why would we do this? And of course, it's got Bible verses for the Christmas trees, the angels, the idolatry, Santa Claus, the elves, Saint Nick, Father Christmas, magical helpers, worldliness, pagan festivals, traditions, greed, hmm, materialism, Christ Mass, December 25th, Saturnalia, Winter Solstice. We talked about some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Historically, it was the birthday of pagan deities. That was celebrated on December 25th. Why include the Holy Son of God in such worldly nonsense? I think it's a good question. I think it deserves an answer. Come out from among the Christmas celebration and be ye separate. Wake up, church. Now, it pains me to do this, but the next picture I've got for you is the Adventist picture that I found. It's not the only Adventist, I, but it, when I could see that it was from Adventist Today and when I went to their website, and I looked up the article that this is advertising, I found out beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's a Seventh-day Adventist magazine online and a Seventh-day Adventist author who spends the entire article rationalizing what we're doing with Christmas. But this was very shocking for me. I hope you can read it. Why it's okay for Christmas to be pagan. That's the Adventist oh, that's picture. Wow. And so, what I hope that I've impressed you with today is not that you believe every word I've told you, okay, or read to you today. That's not my purpose. My purpose is that you would make a decision in your mind that things like this do really matter. 
because the vast majority of the world either thinks it's not true or they shrug their shoulders and they say, what does it matter? Right? <clears throat> so my, my hope with this is to convince you that it does matter. And with very, very little effort on your part, you can study this out for yourself. You don't have to believe everything that I've told you. You can look the Bible verses up yourself. And you can Google it. And you can see. There's not one or two. There's thousands and maybe millions of places on the internet where you can find out a very consistent story. Which is the story of Babylon and the world's false religion. God help us. God help us not just to make the right decisions, but to make a decision. Because if we think that it doesn't matter, we're not even going to make a decision. We're not going to care enough to make a decision. I believe with all my heart, if you study Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11, if you study those chapters, you're going to find out that the children of Israel were committing these so-called abominations. We have some of them named by name, and God tells exactly what He's going to do to them for practicing these evils. He's going to destroy them. I think it matters. Okay, would you come up and lead us in singing what has to be my favorite song? Not the prettiest song necessarily, but it is my favorite song because it says, Give me the Bible. Let us stand as we close. Give me the Bible, store of gladness gleaming, to cheer the wanderer, lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, Thy life shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken. Hold a face lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps enlighten. Teach me the dangers of these realms below. That lamp of safety or the gloom shall brighten. That light alone the path of peace can show. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining. Till my shall vanish in eternal day. Let's kneel as we close in prayer.